Take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel began in the beginning of the letter uh, from the uh, shore of the river in Babylon. The people have been taken into captivity, and God met him there. And as God met him there, he had a word for uh, the people of Israel, but he also had a word for you and I. One of the things that uh, uh, you and I need to look at when we read the Bible is to see the very nature of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. He loves with an everlasting love. So when we look into his word and we see the, uh, in the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God, when we look in there and we can see our Lord and our Savior, our Master, we can see the, the Trinity from the very beginning of, of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation 22. We can see all of them working together in this gift of life. And we can see the nature of God as he reaches out to us. And how God always wants to bless. And how we are all prone to wander. Is that true? I was listening to a podcast of one of my favorite preachers. You may have heard him. His name is Chuck Swindoll. I, I like to hear different preachers who have different styles. And, and his style is almost as if he is sitting in a living room with you and having a conversation in the living room of your home. That's the kind of style preacher he is. And I'm very blessed by that. But, but he was saying uh, on this podcast when he was, he was preaching on the Great Commission, he said that even then, the preacher of all those years, the preacher, uh, the president at one time of a, a Dallas Theological Seminary, he said he had times of doubt. Times where difficult days got him down. I tell you what, to hear a man of God like that say those words, encourage my soul. Because sometimes we play as if we are um, not touched by the difficulties of this world, but I don't know anybody that's not. And, and all God wants is us just to be honest with him. He can handle the tough situations of life. He can handle a heart that, that is, is not sure all the time. And I feel that way. And you feel that way. And we get worn down and weary. And I'm pray, grateful that our God is the God of rest during that time that can come and, and, and grow our souls. So when I look at the book of Ezekiel in chapter 11, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to get you to chapter 34 as quick as I can. But in chapter 11, 11 looking at the circumstances uh, of the, the northern tribe Israel and how they were taken into captivity because of their sin, because of not obeying the word of God, and, and the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, how they were taken into captivity by Babylon once again because their eyes and their hearts strayed from a loving God. And they desired to go their own way, to do their own thing, to do that which pleased them. Listen now. That which was convenient for them. But against the precepts and the concepts and the, and the ways of God, the commandments of God. And in chapter 11, it said that God took his hand of blessing off of them and the term was spoken that I never, ever want to be uh, uh, around at all. The word Ichabod, where the glory of God has departed. May it never be. May we, may we pray and, and understand in a, in, in a place and understanding the tone of when, when it said where two or three are gathered together, he would be in the midst. And that was in a time of difficulty. Understand that. In a time of difficulty, he said, you come together in my name, I'll be there with you. May it never be that we get so haughty and so desirous of what we wish and what we think and what we want that God says, have thine own way, and takes his glory off of it. That's a scary moment. That's the scariest thing I could think about when I think of hell. A place of no hope. Now, people want to talk about 
the torture. But the torture is God won't be there. The torture is, is separation from that which is God. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness. The things of, of blessing that have been removed. That is the definition of hell. And, and may we not wish that upon our worst enemy in this world. Amen? The ones who treat us the, the worst, we should cry over their soul. And then when we get to the middle chapters, and he says he has a, a word for them, and then we get to chapter 34, and he gives us the illustration of how the, the leaders of Israel, he, he used the term shepherds, but they were not the correct kind of shepherds because he, he used, they, they abused the sheep. They took from the sheep. They, they, they had, the sheep was to serve them. It was to all be about them. By the way, our good shepherd, Jehovah Ra, Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. That shepherd never abused his sheep, who only wanted the best for his sheep. But the leaders of Israel made it all about them. But he said, it's okay, I'm going to bring you back. Now, truly, let me put this beautifully in context. Never preach Scripture, never speak Scripture, never read Scripture out of context, right? And in Psalms 34, he is speaking of a day that he's going to call Israel, this is an, a sermon for Israel, Israel back to themselves, and he's going to gather them from the nations, and he will come and be their king. He will be their shepherd. But I, I think he's got a word for us too in that. Hold on, Pastor. You just said this is for Israel. Yes, it's speaking of a moment that will come for Israel, but he's also speaking of a time when God will come upon the earth. Jesus will come upon the earth and looking forward to something for what he will do in the end times that we will be a part of too. But hear this. Tonight, my desire is, is for us to see the nature of God as he reaches out to Israel. And I believe the same nature of God that's seeking to reach out to his people today. You call them whatever you want to. Christians, believers, you can call them the elect. You can call them whatever you want to. The sheep of his pasture. Amen? In Ezekiel 34, let's begin in verse number 20. Therefore, Thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock. That's Jesus' business, is always being there on the behalf of his flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. Listen to verse 23. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. Now, he's not speaking of a resurrected King David. He is speaking symbolically of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who came from the tribe of Judah, the one who would be uh, the, the leader David was spoken of. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Verse 24. And I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. He is saying this is true. This is fact. God will be on the throne. Jesus will leave heaven and come and be among his people. We know that to be true. Amen. Verse 25, I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land. What a day that will be. This is the millennium day that he's speaking of. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. The one thing you would never do is sleep in the woods because being prey to the wild animals that are there. He is saying those things will never be. It will be a land of peace. But I want you to see verse 26. I will make them. And the place is all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come 
down in their season, and that song that we sang tonight, there shall be showers of blessing. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to take just a few moments and talk about verse 26. I think that we need to begin with God when he says, I will. There's so much that we want to do for God. Would y'all agree with that? That was weak. Let me give you one more chance here. There's so much we want to do for God. Amen? Amen. Do you ever feel like a failure? Do you ever judge yourself a little too harshly? Can, can I just give you a, a, a quick word? You can do nothing of your own. Jeremiah, where was his convert? But yet he was the one that God chose to cry out. He wept over the condition of the people. It was a man whose heart was one with God. Our privilege is to be one with God. Our privilege is understanding that John 15 says we abide in him. He abides in us, right? For without him we can do what? Say it again. Say it like you mean it. But he said, I will. That means we can't, but he can. So what he's asking us to do, if we're to be one heart, listen now, where he goes, we go. What he speaks, we speak. His heart will be our heart. So today I went and got gas and went because uh, I wanted to make it home. Y'all good with that? I, I, I got gas and a guy beside me, his truck was broken down. And he looked over at me and said, can you help me? And I said, absolutely. So all he really needed was a jump off. So uh, uh, I, I jumped his car and it cranked in about two seconds. And, and I was helping him get his cables back together. And, and I told him, I said, look, I just came from church. There's no way in the world that I'm going to say no to somebody to help them when I just went to serve a God who's done so very much for me. And all that did was just open up a conversation. And I don't know how many people wanted our spot in the gas station, but we sat there and talked for about five or ten minutes. Amen? All I did, I, I, I can't make that happen. But if I'm one with God, I'm going to be where I am in this life, and he's going to be with me, and he's got a plan there, and, and I don't have to make it happen. But if we will allow the heart of God to impress upon our heart, when God's saying, I will, if we will say, I will, oh, what God can do. Oh, what God can do. So he said, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. God is a God of blessing. God is a God of love who wants to do great and mighty things. Now, I know there are times that we don't see it. And like I've already said, there are times that we, we grow discouraged and weary. But never forget the heart of God. I think that's one of the reasons why at the beginning of, a, of the day we need to begin in prayer. I think we need to run to our word of God and we need to begin our day with the word of God. And I believe we need, to, we need to praise him. Amen? Mark, you do a good job in leading in worship, but I, I think we need to be students of worship, and we need to learn how to praise God when it's just us and God. But hold on. I think we need to begin our day knowing that he's a great big God, and we need to let him know that we love him. But I think we need to finish the day praising him as well. How many of y'all got your gratitude list yet? Praise God, it's happening. It's happening. By your bed, before you go to bed at night, you need to be able to write some things down. You don't, ha you don't need to write a novel, but you need, to, you need to pin down some things that God has done for you that day that you're grateful for, so that on that day of weariness and trials, and, and the, that when the breezes of depression may come, you can go back and you say, I know who my God is. My God is a God of blessings. Now, I might not feel it now, but I know it, right? You cannot argue with your own testimony, unless you're bipolar. <laughs> Amen? A little schizophrenic on the outside, but that's all right. God made you that way too. Look, go back and know. Drive the stake down. Drive it down deep. His love is fast, and it is sure, and it is good. Amen? 
How many of you really not think and believe that in 2020, God wants to bless you? Every day? Any day? Even Monday? Amen. He needs to bless Mondays, don't he? I will make them in the places uh, all around my hills a blessing. I will cause showers to come down in their season. Only God can bring showers. Only God. Matter of fact, he camped out in Habersham County a few days last week. When he brings showers, he don't mind doing them in abundance. There's some things I just can't do, but I serve the God who can. Only God can bring the showers, but he says they come in their season. Jody, uh, down in Honduras, she said they don't have summer and spring and fall and winter. They have the rainy season and the dry season. That's the only season they have down there. Sounds kind of like our life, doesn't it? Sometimes there's the rainy season. But sometimes there's the dry season. Sometimes there's the mountaintops. Sometimes there's a valley. Sometimes there's the feast. Sometimes there's the fasting. Sometimes there's the praise. Sometimes. There are the tears. But he's a God that brings what we need in that season what I'm learning is not to question God sometimes I think that I want him to jump through my hoops I want him to work on my schedule how pompous that may is I don't know about you but the God I know is never early but praise God he's never late there are times that I wanted something to happen and he didn't happen that way but looking back on it, I found him faithful. And you write it down in your gratitude list so you can remember God is always, always faithful. I'm grateful that when we don't go out and plant it, we don't immediately harvest that night. But you know, the butterfly never looks back upon the cocoon and look at it and say, how terrible you were. It was a process to get them where they are now we have to be forged in the fire the crucible that burns the dross of sin away we don't like the heat we want God to stop but before it can be refined there is a season of fire I'm not what I should be but praise God I'm not what I used to be and I don't know what's ahead. John the Baptist's ministry was the greatest at the beginning. But it was profound at the end. He had multitudes that thronged to him and asked him to baptize them. Even Christ himself. But at the end, he was in a jail cell. Hated by a woman. He made... Herod's knees quake and tremble. And we're still talking about his influence today. There are times that we, though we cannot control the season, we are not ministering in the season, but we're complaining in the season. When it's springtime, you do what you're supposed to do in springtime. Amen? Amen? But when it's summertime and harvest time, you do what you're supposed to do in harvest time. And there's a, a, a purpose for fall and preparation. And there's rest in winter when God gets the ground ready for the new spring. I believe that in the time of Israel that we will seek about in a moment, God has brought them together. They've been through wars what was it, the seven-day war? Was that what it was? it five days or seven days in 1973? Six days. Well, I shot in there amongst it, didn't I? <laughs> Amen. We're going to cut that out of the tape up there. We'll edit that part out. The six-day war. Who fights a war in six days? 
Israel does. And you know what always blessed me about that? The same people who attacked Israel went back to the United Nations and begged the United Nations to get Israel to stop. They were ready. They had the tanks coming into Israel, and they had to stop and turn around and, and flee as fast as they could to get back to Damascus. You think God had a hand in that? Now look, when we look at this scripture and other scriptures that speak about how, what God is going to do in the midst of Israel in the last days, it needs to gather your attention that those things are beginning to happen now. And, and I'm going to be blunt with you, and you can call me a political kook if you want to. I don't care about Iran, and I don't care about Saudi Arabia, and I don't care about Iraq. They don't scare me. We need to stand on the behalf of Israel. And if the, when those people in our country today are, are, are crying out against Israel, they are putting themselves on the opposite side of God. These things that we're reading about here are already beginning. He said, I will make them in the places all around my hill a blessing. I will cause showers to come down upon them in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. I just want to say this, not drops, showers. When we sing the song, we say, mercy drops round us are falling. And we can see that, amen? But for the showers, we plead. I'm grateful for what God's doing in the small ways, but I don't know about you. I'm looking for the downpour. I'm looking for the downpour. In 1986 at Thanksgiving when I surrendered to the call to preach, I asked God for two things. He did one within a couple months. The second thing that I asked for was I said sometime in my ministry, sometime in my life, I wanted to see a revival like I had heard the old preachers and the old members talk about. They talked about a, a revival that would come that would impact an entire city. They, they talked about a revival that would come that could not be bound by man. They talked about revivals that would come that mills would be shut down in. They talked about revivals, and I've seen the pictures of revivals where hundreds of people would be baptized. And I, I've, I've read the stories. I, I, I kind of like the testimonies and the stories in history of where we've seen that. From the coal mines in the United Kingdom, Wales, to, to the places in, in Australia and Africa. I, I, I've seen the stories and I've heard the stories of the outpouring. But I've never experienced it. And I've always been a little jealous. Oh, there's always some that say, well, way back when, praise God for way back when, but Brother Bradley, I want to taste it today. I've seen a few brush fires. This came in March 10 years ago when my dad died. I had a church member say that he was praying that, that God would put a double portion of my dad's spirit within me. The person you're working for, Lynn. We went to Dalton for the, where my dad was laying in, in state. And we had, I, I told the church, I said, y'all go on with the revival. I'm not going to be there. I got I to gotta, I gotta go honor my father. But um, a normal service, Brother Mark, but the invitation lasted two and a half hours. People got up and were confessing sin. The next night, my, we laid my dad in, in, in rest of it in Tekoa. I went to the service that night, and it went two hours. But it faded. We got close, but I've still never seen. And I don't know, but I have a sneaking suspicion that there's a lot of people in this building tonight that want to see the same movement of God that's unmistakably Him, that can't be explained by anything else. It won't be explained by a preacher or by a singing group 
or, or by anything else than, than the powerful hand of God pouring out upon his people. A sprinkle may be enough for some, but I want a shower of blessing. He says in verse 27, then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Praise God. That's what trees are for, amen? To yield their fruit. The earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land. They shall know that, here's the phrase I told you, it's 40 times in the book of Ezekiel. This is another one of those 40 times. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hands of those who enslaved them. They shall no longer be a a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them. And they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. I know he's talking about Israel. Verse 29, I will raise up for them a garment of renown, a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. I have not been to Israel, but I'm told that that place is blooming. Everywhere that you go, you see the crops that are, that are blooming and they're overflowing. Verse 30. Thus they shall know that I am the Lord their God and with them. And they are the house of Israel and my people, says the Lord God. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men and I am your God, says the Lord God. Now I understand that's the word of the Old Testament, but folks, he's promised Blessings upon his church, too. Flip over. I'm going to just finish this real quick, but I want you to look to the 43rd chapter. Ezekiel 43, verse number 1. You there say amen. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. The glory of the God of Israel. That's my God too. His voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. That was in the very beginning of the, the book. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chabar and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate which faces towards the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Ezekiel saw the glory of the Lord, the anointing of God, depart. And Ichabod. But by the power of God, he was taken in a vision to a future day when God, Jesus, our Lord, would be there in the temple and the glory of God would rest on that place today. I want you to go to the last chapter, chapter 48. And I want you to look at the very last verse. He goes on in that last chapter from verse 21 down to verse 35 to describe the, the temple. But in verse 35 it says, all the way around shall be 18,000 cubics. But here's the part I want you to see. And the name of the city from that day shall be Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. We just came through Christmas and we talked about Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Praise God that Jesus is with us. That there's going to be a day. The Father will be in his right place. The Spirit will have completed his job. And Christ will remain King of Kings. Lord of Lords, Master, no beginning, praise God, no end. The God of blessing will be with us. And where he is, Jehovah Shema, God is there. That is my prayer, my prayer for New Holland.
By the way, New Holland could not in any way, shape, form, or fashion contain all that. God comes here. I think he'll just scatter himself all over Gainesville and Hall County, don't you? I believe if God's presence comes, it might even reach that little place south of here. What is it called? It starts with an A. I don't know. About four million people down there. Y'all ever heard of it? You think they need the glory of the Lord down there too? Matter of fact, if God shows up, like he will one day in Jerusalem, we know that to be true. God so cho chooses to bless this place. He finds a people that are seeking to be just linked up heart to heart with him. Wonder what he could do. Don't tell me what my God can't do. My imagination can't quit thinking of all the things that he can do. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see <laughs> and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace and he'll take me by the hand and lead me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Can y'all say, even so come, Lord Jesus? Let's pray. Father, you are so perfect, so good. Father, we are a people in need of a touch that can come only by you. Father, I gra I'm grateful that there's some promises that you made. And you've never come up short, not even one time. And I am grateful for what you're going to do for your chosen people, Israel. They were to be the witness of the world, and they turned their back upon that. But Lord, you're going to save them. Your word says, even in a day. And Lord, I do look for the day that you'll come back and gather us home. But Lord, whether by life or through the avenue of death, may I serve you. Father, may I seek, may we seek to put everything away from us in our life that does not look like you, smell like you, and bring you honor and glory. Father, may we fall in love with that word once again, the word repentance. Because blessing always follows repentance. Father, we're a needy people. We're hungry. And Lord, if you're in heaven looking upon a place to rain down your glory, would you consider us? Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Consider our hearts. Father, you always do that which is good and right and best. And Lord, you are God and I am not. And I'm not telling you what to do. But Lord, until then, we're going to be about your business. We're going to seek to draw as close as we can. Like I said this morning, Lord, we want to dance on the edge of heaven until the doors of heaven open. Father, we want to be so close that you don't have to reach out far by your powerful hand to put your hand of anointing and blessing upon us. Lord, may souls be saved. May families be regained. Lord, may the testimonies resound throughout our community. Lord, uh, give us an opportunity. Once again, send the showers of blessing. And Father, I pray that it begins in me. I pray that, Lord, you will ignite it in our hearts, even in this room. Father, on a Sunday, cold Sunday night, at the beginning of 2020, Lord, even so come. Even so come. Father, bless our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.